I go for refuge and soon enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha by my accumulation for the practice of giving and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit all such human beings. I go for refuge and soon enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha by my accumulation for the practice of giving and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit all such human beings. I go for refuge and soon enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha by my accumulation for the practice of giving and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit all such human beings. <clears throat> okay, we will read some of the passages here and then, if possible, we will do the question answers. But there are many of the questions that came during the discussion. Okay. Nirvana is the experience of emptiness, within the experience of emptiness, where all the miseries, dissatisfactions dissolve. And the involuntary come over. What happened to stand in love? Okay, where the involuntary pull and push stops, that is the total freedom. This is what we discussed. Okay, so if you see, if you see uh, the Nirvana in this context, we described earlier, the unborn, okay, unborn, not erased, uncreated, uncompounded, in the form of the emptiness experience, then we can understand what nirvana is. Okay, why is it called dependent arising? It's called dependent arising because it is causal and conditional. Okay, dependent arising um, of the three understanding of dependent origination, what the main emphasis placed here is the causal dependent origination. It says it is called dependent arising because it is causal and conditional. Not non-causal and non-conditional. In this connection, the Bhagavan concisely taught the characteristics of dependent arising as follows. Okay, so I'd like to uh, the reiterate what we discussed this morning. That the whole universe is operating on the basis of cause-effect relationship. In other words, whole universe uh, say the okay how the Buddha operates, how the Buddha benefits into beings, it operates, that really transcends the cause and effect. Otherwise the whole universe is operating. For the Buddha there's no time gap. Time gap between say the Buddha is in for example say Dharmasala and then you ought to be benefited. There's no time lapse. And if you have the karmic connection with the Buddha then it's instant. The benefit is instant. This is something so unique of the Buddha's the activities. Otherwise, the whole universe is operating on basis of the cause and effect relationship. This is the dependent origination nature. And um, so, the, you go through the gade, gade, para gade, para samgade, vishnum emptiness. You, in the process of being immersed into vishnum emptiness, you are also operating with respect to you, the cause and effect dissolves. But with respect to others, you are still operating within the cause and effect relationship. You are still operating. Okay. So, in other words, the universe is operating on the basis of the dependent origination of the cause and effect relationship. Which means that it is only through cause and effect that composite things come to be. There is no external agent 
to decide that okay, this should happen, this should happen. So there's no external agent to determine what the results are going to be like. It is merely through cause and effect, the causes conditions that the effects are determined. That's this is the dependent notion issue. In this connection, the Bhagavad concisely taught the characteristics of dependent arising as follows. Results come from their own specific conditions. Results, they come from, they arise from their own specific cause conditions, not from not, uh, non cause and non conditions. In this connection, the Bhagavad concisely taught the characteristics of dependent arising as follows. Results come from their own specific conditions. Whether the Tanga does appear or not, this true nature of things will remain. Okay, the Tanga means the Buddha. Whether the Buddha exists or not, whether the Buddha is there or not, this is not the point. The reality existed where the Buddha Shakyamuni, the way, the way before the Buddha Shakyamuni appeared on this earth, the reality existed. So, what is that reality? The reality of dependent origination. What did the Buddha do? Buddha discovered that. So till the time of the Buddha Shakyamuni, um, no one was there, literally no one was there on this earth to discover this reality of dependent origin, where everything is operating just on the basis of the dependent, uh, dependence on the cause and effect. And till the point of Buddha Shakyamuni appearing, then the, the concept, concept of you know, external agent, that is, there was so uh, the pertinent, there was so strong, uh, they were so obvious there, they believed that there must be some agent to dictate all these things. Okay, in this connection, I'd like to share this, this thoughts with you. In fact, I'm very happy that when I was in my monastery, in Debong Monastery, I remember that at one point, the, my approach is a little skeptic, skeptic or what do you call it, questioning mind. Then what happened was that it was my, the, say, from the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics in the Dharamsala. From there I studied for about like seven, six or seven years. And then from there I joined the Muslim Monastery, somewhere in between. Because I don't have to follow from the beginning. So in between I joined. And then I see all how the farmers work in South India, how the farmers work. And I was so, so fascinated by that. How the farmers work. And the farmers work precisely in accordance with the weather. The weather and the farmers work, the farming and the weather, these two sync so well. And I was so fascinated. Who must be dictating, dictating that? There must be some dictator. There must be some agent to decide. I was so fascinated. You won't believe. First, what happened was that till Till like um, March, till like March, very dry, hot, and the, the, particularly in the Debum area, the Mundur area, very dry and uh, like a barren, total barren, and everything yellow, mud, dry mud, dry clay. Then the, I think the first week of first week of April, then it started to drizzle. Drizzle means that the earth is being softened by the water. It's amazing. Then in two days it stops. The drizzle stops. Then the farmers go there to hit the, the solid mud, solid clay, because they're already softened by the drizzle. They hit them and made them small. And then again, there is again after, after a few days, again there is more pour, pouring rain. And again stops. Then your job is go to put the seed. It's amazing. Once the seed is put, again a few days, like one or two, one or two weeks rain. That is for to sprout. Once it sprout, again the rain will stop for some days. That's to, to take out the wheat. <laughs> you take out the wheat and then it rains for the next, like continues for two or three 
May, sometimes no rain. In like two months, three months, it rains, stops, rains, stops, rains. Then rain stops. Rain stops, then the crops are already ready. They're already ready. It needs a little bit of time for them to ripen fully without rain. And the rain stops completely. Then you have to harvest them. Amazing. I was so as how the farmers they work totally in sync with the nature. There must be somebody who is dictating this. Who is really making the controlling the rains. Controlling the rains is amazing. This is one thing which really amazed me. I mean, who is that? Who is doing that? I was so amazed. Number one. Whereas if I was born there, then I would take for granted. On the road. Born in settlement? No. Born in settlements? No word, okay, so for you it's completely taken for granted. So for me, no, it was so fascinating. Then another great fascination to me was that the, all the water that we get in the monastery was from the bore well. Bore well. And then there, at one point there was a little problem. The water level going down. And then again, the thought came to me, because I was in the Himachal for so long, for all these many years, my child was always in the Himachal. So there, water from... No, water from Borgel is very unlikely, unlike in those days. It's all from the snow. So, then come, going there, do something, the warm water coming from the Borgel. I was so fascinated how the, the nature works. So first, the... Snow, snow is thrown on the, uh, thrown on the, uh, the high mountains. So how high mountains, they keep the, the water there in the form of solid snow, so that it doesn't go at one go. So it's reserved, it kept there as a storage. It's like the, the dam, the snow mountain there, like the dam to keep the water there in the form of snow, and it gradually melts. Whatever is required is it melts, and then people get it. And most of them people use it, and many of, much of the water they go underneath. Why underneath? Because the water cannot go all the way down to be distributed equally. So what they do? Some they go down the earth, so that people on the surface cannot use everything. They can use what they want, and others they go down and go down. They flow down, and then those on the plain they don't get this clean water coming from the, the on the surface. But never mind, the nature has put it, sent them down for them. They dig it and they get water from there. It's amazing, amazing. Then use it, they use it and they're all thrown into the ocean. Thrown into the ocean, never mind. Then they, will, they should be recycling. Then the water should go back to the mountains. Otherwise, again, you will not get water. But never mind, the sun. Right? And then water evaporates from the ocean. And then evaporates, they don't throw it all the ocean. They take it all the way to the mountains. It's amazing in the form of the cloud, the mountains. Then they throw it in the form of snow, not in the form of water. In the form of water, it just flushed down everything. In the form of snow, so that it will be kept there. And then again, it's so beautiful. Who is that age who is taking this? I was so fascinated. Okay, then I thought that, okay, with this guaranteed, some people in the past, they must have created the concept of God on this basis. Seeing these natural you know, cycle, there must be some Asian who is controlling this. So, uh, the, I think 2004 or 5, after the Magishi degree, then when I was in Dharamsala, I happened to read one book. The book is, the title, it, the book is so beautiful, you must read that. The book is, the title is, the rise of civilizations. The rise of civilizations. It's a beautiful book. This would make our mind very objective in our look of the reality. The rise of civilization. I learned that this is this was being used as one of the textbooks of BA BA course. I read that and that, that tells us how all these religions came to being. How all these religions came to being. Say the 
Judaism, there may be different kinds of Hinduism, uh, then Buddhism, Jainism, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, and the Chazam, Sri Krishna theory, how the rise of Sri how everything uh, the came to be, so beautifully explained. So the religions, how the religions came to be is very beautiful. Say, early men, early men, no concept of the religion, just survival, uh, fighting with the, fighting with the wild animals. Are you to fight or are you to die? This is the early man. And for that, you are hungry. You need food. So you should be able to run after the deer, the deers. Right? You should be as fast as them. Otherwise, you will not get any food. And then you don't know how to plant the, the crops. And then, in the night, they are so scared. Because they are very scary. What animals there? They can easily eat you up. They also need no food. And you are so weak as compared to the wild animals. You cannot run as fast as the deers. So you become so you become so vulnerable. So there's so much of fear. Then what happens? The they invent the they, they discover fire. They discover fire and the with the fire they are able to get warm and then they're also able to protect themselves from the wild animals. Then in the daytime, they feel more happy that they can actually run, you know, in different places and so forth. So the sun becomes very important. Sun becomes very important. So this is so powerful, sun. So the god of sun is created. This is so powerful. Then you, very, in a crude way, they start to worship the sun. In a very crude way. Then the people, their thought process develops and made it more sophisticated. Then created the concept of this, the, the god of sun. Sun God. And then the thunder is very scary. Thunder is very scary. Oh, this is someone there. The, the thunder God. All oh, this slowly came to be. Then the concept of the whole comes with the God, Creator. All these things developed slowly, gradually. It's not like you suddenly came up with the concept of God. No. This all developed very gradually. If you objectively think about this, you cannot say no. This is how the human imagination grew. For example, okay, I'm in Tibet, I can talk for Tibet, that's fine. Say, guaranteed in the, the ancient Indian time, the Dune, Aramigarjana, and those great teachers' time, when the Buddhism was really at its peak, I don't think these very complicated Tibetan, the sitting thrones, very complicated ones, and the flute. Ritual, three very complicated ones, and not there. Gradually, people start to pick it, you know, more and more complicated, more and more complicated, more and more complicated, then it becomes like this. Even in the original language, this is all missing, and now in Tibet, everything can be very sophisticated, very colorful, everything. In a way, it's good, because they invest everything on the spirituality. Invest everything on spirituality. Even the ceremony is also spirituality. Music also spirituality, and everything is the root with the spirituality. In a way, it's very good. But there, the originality, there's a danger that the origin, the original version may disappear. The good thing about Tibet was that the original did not disappear because, of the eighth century A.D. Bodhisattva Shankarachita, he encouraged the Tibetan king to introduce, to translate all these original texts, Sanskrit texts, into Tibetan. One, and then he inserted the Tibetans learning Sanskrit, he asked them to translate this and teach everything in Tibetan rather than teaching them in Sanskrit. So that really kept the Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist teaching so crystal clear and uh, fresh and other ritual parts, they all become more and more elaborate. I was so fascinated when I, when I actually you saw the, the Indian fire puja. Indians performing the fire puja. Hindus, their fire puja. Their fire puja is very simple. And when the sophisticated Tibetan fire puja came to be, how did it come to be? Very sophisticated with a very beautiful letter, letter to pour the oil in the fire. Very ornamented, decorated. And the Indian version, the Hindu version, original place, is very simple. 
put in one, like put like this, and like put in one. It's very simple. And to when the way, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Right? So I don't think I'm, uh, uh, I'm sure he must have done some fire pressure. But the fire pressure must have done with the wooden, you know, little, but not with the sophisticated ornamented gold, silver, and the what? The coral and the pearl. No, not at all, like that. So I think these are later developments. This is the rise of the civilization. Right? So luckily with Tibet, the outsiders, if they look at Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism and original Indian Buddhism, they think that Tibetan Buddhism is the original. <laughs> it's so ornamented, so beautiful, colorful, it's amazing. Right? Chandans. So in the original India, I'm sure there were a little bit of dance was there, issue dance was there, but not I'm sure it is not as complicated with it, such a colorful as the developments. There are all little developments, I'm very sure. Yeah. Okay, nowadays, okay, I'm not going to do much with that, otherwise, okay, I don't know what people think. And what I think, one thing that I have is the say for example the the what do you call it the bone ornaments bone ornaments which the the lamas sometimes they you know use um, during the empowerments and so forth so there in India who actually put on these bone ornaments they were used by the great saint like the great saint Dilupa. Narupa and so forth. I'm sure that you know, they, do, they hardly have any the, you know, the clothes. It's a very sparsely good. And then some bones, you know, there to remember impermanence. That's it. And now the Tibetans is very decorative in the first place, brocade, and then on top of that, the bones. This number misses. So what I'm saying is that rise of civilization. Luckily, luckily with the Tibetan, the philosophy, psychology, logic, these three are so well preserved in Tibet. Had it not been for these three things, then the Tibetan Buddhism, whether it's really Buddhism or not, is questionable. These three things are so beautifully preserved there in Tibet. Really, really preserved so well. The Nalanda tradition, real Nalanda traditions preserved by the Tibetans along with the other fabrications they developed but that real the knowledge tradition that is something beautifully preserved and there are many other outcomes other outcomes the reincarnation system all these things in tibet so these all things they are, they, they are developed in tibet they were never existed in india yeah so new this is as time passes new development developments are bound to happen as long as the, the essence is not lost it's fine then. Yeah. Luckily with the twin Buddhism, the essence is not lost. This is so beautiful. Particularly the three big monastic universities. Sera de Bungandan and the other also with Sakya, Kaiku, Nima, Gilu, the study centers. They are like the really the reservoir of these treasures of the Naranta. These, if they disappear, finish, then it's very dangerous. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so we were reading um, page 65, stand, uh, paragraph 2. Why is it called dependent and arising? It is called dependent and arising because it is causal and conditional. There is no external agent here. It is purely the causal conditions. And, for example, the what I notice of the water, how the water is recycled, and water is the source of the survival of the, 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 the species and the humanity. For that, the water, how it recycles. So this also because of, purely because of the cause and effect, cause and effect, and how, how the farmers sink the deep, uh, the natural, the weather, weather system is also purely through cause and effect. No external agent which determines that. So there, when we think of the external agent, there we are solidifying, we are solidifying, we are objectifying things. We are things. 
Now with the study of dependent origination, objectification. This objectification, we don't need anybody to teach us. Objectification. We are already expert from since time immemorial till now. Objectification. We don't see things in a dependent origination form. We see things as independent, objectified, solidified. This is how we are, how we came on earth since time immemorial. Now the job is to desolidify things. It's not easy. Solidification of mind happened since time immemorial. So it takes time to desolidify that. So for that matter, what we are learning here, um, we, okay, for example, this rain. This rain is because of what depends on other factors. For example, look, it's not just raining, it's with the wind. Because this area it will be warmer than the other area. So the cold comes in that manifests in the form of the wind. So it's all the dependent origination. Okay. <clears throat> In this connection, 65, second paragraph, line 3. In this connection, the Bhagavan concisely taught the characteristics of dependent arising as follows. Results come from their own specific conditions. Whether the power that appear or not, these two nature of things will remain. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, will remain. It is the true nature. It's the true nature. True nature meaning? <clears throat> and then this also is the true nature. By the pen is not closing the window, the sound stops. Everything is operating on this of the dependent origination. And two of them two of them knew that this coming from the dependent origination. Right? So they try to stop the factors depending on which the sound is so loud inside. So what is the factor? Keeping the windows open. So by removing that, by closing the windows, then the factor for the sound to be so loud inside is stopped. So the sound inside stops. This is dependent origination. Okay, so we, this is advice to see everything in light of dependent origination. Our own life, our own experience, everything, whatever we do. Okay, for example, let's say that the, the okay, let's say some of you may uh, they touch your glass like this, there's also dependent origination. You feel a discomfort, you know? And when you say like this, it's also dependent on situation. <laughs> right? It's amazing. So we should be able to, able to see everything in the life of dependent origin. There what happens? Dependence, independence is dissolved. So in a mind, it will take the time to dissolve the independence, sense of independence, sense of object existence. This solidification has to be happening. Okay. It is true nature. 6 to 5, paragraph 2, line 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's a true nature. Okay, true nature here, we can think of in both ways. Dependent origination as well as the emptiness, other side. Dependent origination is also the true nature in the sense that this is what governs. This is the true nature which governs the universe, operation of the universe. Dependent origination. Emptiness side. What we see is the other side. Emptiness is also the true nature. True nature, this is the final nature. So the question still remains. How dependent origination is not the ultimate truth? How emptiness is the ultimate truth? This is what, did we discuss this? In the, in the group discussion, did we discuss? No, and if we didn't come to an answer, we should have some want you to explain that. We didn't reach a conclusion. Okay, you do not reach a conclusion. Okay, so? We would like you to explain that to us. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Right? Okay, so the question is, it's got something that's, this true nature, the constancy of dharma. Okay, constancy of dharma? Dharma, here, 
Uh, dharma here does, Dharma has many connotations. Dharma in the in the form of phenomena, existence. Number one, dharma in the form of the spirituality. Dharma in the form of spirituality. Dharma in the form of the, the dharma in the form of the phenomena. That is the existence. Every existence is known as dharma. Dharma is beautiful. Dharma has a connotation of the same dharma is connotation of holding an identity. Holding an identity. Holding. Holding. To hold. Dharma is a contribution to hold. To hold means every phenomenon is dharma. In the sense that every phenomenon, they hold its own identity. They hold its own identity. This one we understand about dharma. So from this, in this context, dharma, everything, good, bad, everything is the dharma. This is number one. Phenomena and dharma, these two are synonymous. Another dharma is to hold you from suffering. To hold you from suffering. That is a dharma in the context of spirituality. So dharma has two connotations. Good? Okay, so here, consciousness of dharma, this is the dharma in the form of the phenomena, not the spiritual practice. Consciousness of dharma, meaning that uh, this reality, this reality of dependent origination is the dharma, is the phenomena, this is this which has been a constant. Since time immemorial till now, will be constant all the way down. This is the reality which will be constant throughout. Constant of dharma. The immutability of the dharma. Immutability meaning that, okay, one time it was dependent origination, now dependent origination is outdated, it is independent origination. It doesn't change. That, that, the, that the world, this universe operated by dependent origination will never change. It is forever immutable. Consistent with dependent arising. So this reality that we are talking about is consistent with dependent arising means it is the dependent arising. It operates, it's the nature of dependent arising. How the, the universe is operating is in the nature of dependent arising. And suchness, that is the reality. Suchness, unmistakable suchness. This is what, if, you, if somebody sees that, if, I see, if somebody sees this dependent origination, you are not mistaken. For example, if I see this book as a chocolate, it's mistaken. But if you see this dependent origination, it's not mistaken. It was in a cause with the reality. Unmistaken. Unerring. Unerring, okay. By seeing, for example, say, um, the, okay, let me say that there is the Say there is a the, what is it, the road, road sign, road sign, signpost. You call it signpost? Road sign. Signpost. 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 Let's say signpost. Say this is going towards, this is going towards, let's say the, uh, what? Say? Huh? Koromangal, let's say Koromangal. And if the signpost put the opposite side, opposite side, you look at the signboard. Have you seen the signboard of the Koramangla? Have you seen the signboard? Koramangla, yes. then the arrow is there. Have you seen the signpost? Yes, you have seen the signpost. You follow the signpost, it will take you the wrong direction. You get it? Whereas you see the signpost of the emptiness or dependent origination, it will never err. It will never take you to mistake and into suffering. It will only take you to the happiness. It's unerring. Okay. The next, more of a dependent arising emerges from two principles. Okay, now this is, this is what we have to learn a little bit. It's not difficult, but this is where we need to reflect more. Reflect more, so the imprint, imprint for our solidification, stops. Imprint of seeing things as independent, stops. More of a dependent arising emerges from two principles. From what two principles? From the causal relation and conditional relation. Causal relation and condition. Cause, causal and condition. The condition. From the point of view of the cause, from the point of view of the condition. Okay. Furthermore, it should be understood as twofold outer and inner. Okay, now we have four things causal, condition, outer, inner. With the outer, with the outer, causal, condition, 
with the inner fossil condition. What is the outer? What is inner? Inner meaning the 12 legs of dependent origination. How the sensual beings, how the sensual beings, this inner refers to the beings, how the sensual beings, they, they, they revolve around samsara and they can come out of samsara. This is the inner sensual beings. Outer, outer container, outer habitat, the world. Outer habitat, for example, external flower, external house, and the, say, the, the sun, the daytime, day night, all these things which are outer with respect to the person, with respect to the beings. These are the outer, outer and inner. The next is causal and what? Condition, causal and condition. Okay, conditional. I don't know whether this is good English. Causal and condition. What is causal and condition? For example, say the what is the outer dependent origination? Give an example. Outer dependent origination. The rain comes. The rain fall, falling, fall of rain, and the crops growing, flowers growing, all these what do you see externally things operating, this all Outer dependent origination. Inner dependent origination, you the sentient beings. The sentient beings, how they they come into existence into samsara by dependent origination, how they can come out of samsara by dependent origination. This is the, the inner dependent origination. What is causal? What is condition? What is the I don't know what is conditional. What is the causal dependent origination and what is the dependent origination of the condition? Okay, additional is very is a little problematic. Okay, so what is what is the meaning of the causal and what is the meaning of the condition? That is, for example, let's say uh, that let's say the flower, the flower, you plant a seed, you plant seed, then shoot comes out. So seed is the cause, and the shoot is the effect. Now from the shoot. Then the, let's say the, the, the petals, the buds, the, the, the flower bud, the bud come to be. So bud is the effect and shoot is the cause. Now from the bud, the flower comes to be. Flower is the effect and the bud is the cause. Then from the flower, the fruit is coming to be. Fruit is the effect and the flower is the cause. So this is the causal. causal. Then the con condition. Condition, for example, what is required? Element of earth. Element of earth, the earth is what is required. Element of water is required. Element of the element of heat, fire, which is sunlight, is required. Okay, sunlight is required for what? Sunlight, light is required or heat is required? No, no, what is required? Heat is required or the light is required? Photosynthesis is the photosynthesis or heat synthesis? Huh? Huh? Light. Light. Light is fire synthesis, which is what she said. What she said? Photosynthesis is from the light. Not heat. No. But you do need heat from the sun, so heat. Exactly. We need both. We need both. We need both. Okay. We need both. With the heat, but in dark, it will not grow. Uh, with, with so much light, with the zero degree centigrade, it will not grow. Right? We need both. Okay. Then the, the space is required. Then the air is required. And then the time is required. Time. For the, the crops to grow, we need the time. Okay, so then these six elements, elements, they are the conditions and the same object, same seed transforming into the shoot, shoot transforming into the stem, transforming into the bud, into the flower, into the fruit, that's the causal. And then the, the water, soil, sunlight, all these are the conditions. Likewise, for us, the, the Inner dependent origination. See? Ignorance gives rise to. Okay, now 12 lanes. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you have more fingertips, I know. 
I know you have. Jack, I know you have. Huh? You said ignorance. You are saying the word, that's it, karma. Karma, very good. Ignorance gives rise to karma. Karma gives rise to? Consciousness. Consciousness gives rise to? Okay, let's see. Uh, the, the 12 lengths, as per the painting. As per the painting. <laughs> okay, as per the painting. Name and form. Name and form. Sources. Six sources. Or the five sources, six sources. Then? Contact. Then? Feeling. Then? Attachment or craving. Then? Grasping. Then? Become or existence. Becoming existence. Same. Then? Birth. Then? Aging and death. Wonderful. Amazing. It's all like you made all the 12 things on your fingertips. Wonderful. Okay. So, the, this is the, this 12 links is the inner dependent origination pertaining to the causes, causal dependent origination of the, the inner. Now the condition, even for us, for the ignorance to give rise to the karma, karma to give rise to the name and form, name and form give, to give rise to the Okay, name and form in the mother's womb. Name and form. So there, then you're being formed. Name and form in the mother's womb. You keep developing. Keep developing. So for that matter, again, we need the uh, conditions for you to develop, to grow. What conditions are required? Again, the six elements are required. So the conditions here, the Buddha, the Buddha taught related to the six elements. It's the conditions in both cases, inner as well as outer. Okay, let's read this. Then the, after this, then we will, if you have questions, we will, I'll take some questions. Um, paragraph 3, stanzas, page 65, paragraph 3. Moreover, dependent arising emerges from two principles. From what two principles? From a causal relation and a conditional relation. Relation of condition. Furthermore, it should be understood, it refers to dependent origination, Dependent origination should be understood as twofold: outer and inner. Outer, inner referring to the sentient beings, and outer referring to the phenomena other than the sentient beings. Okay, what is the causal relation in outer dependent arising? Causal relation in outer dependent arising, and the the condition relation in outer dependent arising. Likewise. Causal relation in the inner dependent arising, condition dependent or the relation in inner dependent arising. What is the causal relation in outer dependent arising? It is as follows: from a seed comes a sprout. First you plant a seed, then it gives rise to a sprout. From a sprout, a leaf. From a leaf, a stem, a small stem that comes up. From a stem, a pedicel. A pedestal is like the small butt, like a small butt, pedestal. From pedestal, a pistol. From pedestal, then the, the essence, essence of the flower, it comes out. From the pistol, a flower. Then from the flower, a fruit. Okay, this is how, with example, example for an external dependent origination, how the flower comes into being, how the fruits come into being, for the mangoes they come into being, then the apples they come to be in South India. What what, what is grown in South India? Mangoes grown, bananas, papayas, coconuts, sugar cane. Sugar cane is a fruit. I see. This is a little okay. Oranges, grapes. About watermelon. Okay, so all this, all this, they grow from. And what about pineapple? It grows. Okay, so they all grow from fun. They come out from the flower. And how the flower came to be with the previous cause, cause, cause. Finally, the seed. So this is how external dependent origination comes to be, but depends on the, the in the causal relation. That's the causal relation. Okay. If there is no seed, the sprout cannot arise and so on. Until finally, without the flower, the fruit cannot arise. So this is where without being the seed, 
Without the seed, the shoot would not arise. Without the shoot, then the, the what? The stem would not arise. Without the stem, then the pedestal would not arise. Without the pedestal, the pistol would not arise. Without the pistol, the flower would not arise. Without the flower, the fruit will not arise. So this is how the causally they are connected. And from this, the moment we think like this, what happens is that we have a very instinctive feeling of, you know, say, some Asian creating all these things. And there's one traditional ancient, ancient Indian philosophy <coughs> known as Okay, this is amazing. In India, so many philosophy, the philosophical traditions came to be amazing, and some of just opposites. For example, let's say the. Do you see this beat? How perfect is this beat in terms of the spherical shape? How good? Very proper shape. Okay, from this, from this, would you, okay, what, are you, what is your very natural reaction? You see these beads, do you think that this, these are made of the, the machines or you think that it's grown from some, the, the seed? The seed is so perfectly round. What, you, what, what would you think? What would be your natural reaction? Machine. Some machine. Okay, from there we could infer the machine. Now, beans. Beans. They are so amazingly smooth and round, right? And the thorns, they are extremely fine and very fine and pointed. Right? And the feather, the pico feathers, they are so beautiful. Right? Okay. Seeing this, two opposite philosophical views came to be. One says that look at these, who created? We cannot create this. It's created by an Asian. There's an Asian there. This is one extreme. Looking for some very solidified external Asian there who created all of these things. Even with the human effort, we cannot really make that this as smooth as the round beams, as pointed as the needle, the, the tones, as beautiful as the, the pick of feathers. There's some external Asian there which creates all these things. This is one extreme. And then the extreme is that no. Right? There is no, there is no past life. There is no extermination. It's just randomly coming to being. Random production, Chavaka tradition. It's amazing, which means that there's a total freedom in you know talking. There's total democracy there in India in those days. One says that no, this is totally uh, random. No past, no rebirth, no nothing. This is only life, right? You're born, you die, finish. Everything disappears, that's it. Right? And who created these round beings that naturally came into being? No, you don't need any creator. It randomly came into being. The beans, you know, smooth beans, and the pointed needles. And the, so look, one says that there's no cause at all. It's purely random. One says that yes, not only there's a cause, the cause is a permanent agent there. Some agent which dictates all our movements and all actions. These are different philosophical traditions that exist on the earth in India. Okay, so whereas the Buddha is saying that yes, there is a cause, there are randomness can never be the answer. There are causes and conditions, but it's purely causes and conditions. No agent which dictates all what we are doing. Purely causes and conditions. So unless until unless until I say we are able to disolidify. A sense of solidification which we already inherited from past lives. Once we able to do that, then the, to get to emptiness. Of course, the emptiness, luckily, emptiness is not something that we have to wait for blessings of the, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. We don't have to wait for the blessings. Right? We just study it very systematically with the other factors intact. You will see emptiness. The moment you see emptiness, you see that everything is dependent on originator. Nothing is independent in there. Nothing. Right? Nothing is independent there. For example, the same. Um, 
How many siblings do you have? Siblings. One. Is there anybody who, who does not have any sibling? Okay, Manuji. Manju. Manjuji. So Manjuji, what's your mother's name? Parvati. Parvati. Well, let's say, <coughs> Parvati is the mother on this earth, is the mother only with respect to Manjuji. You agree with me or not? In Manjuji's eyes, the moment you see, the moment she sees Parvatiji, mother, it is only with respect to her consciousness that the Parvatiji arises as the mother. Nobody else, not me, not you, not, the, not even the Buddhas, she is not a mother. Only with respect to Parvatiji, no, <laughs> Manjuji. Parvatiji arises as a mother. This is reality. Nobody created that she is a mother is created by Manju, Manjuji. Only with the Manjuji is with respect to Manjuji's mind, she becomes a mother. Only by dependence on this, purely dependent origination. There's nothing, no external agent, no agent to dictate the Parvatiji to be the mother as a mother. This is purely dependent origination. This is very important. The point is not, okay, for us, the point is not to denigrate any system. Keep this in mind. It is not to denigrate the systems. It is not to compare with other traditions, not to undermine other traditions. But the point is to deconstruct our misperceptions and inculcate the, the correct cognitive thought process and then reach to the state of fearlessness and the state of infinite happiness. This is a goal. If this does not happen, then study for all these things, if this does not take us to the end, no point. The point is to discover the reality and then wake up from this type of ignorance by disolidifying things to see that finally it is my mind that is solidifying things. It is my mind which is solidifying things. In reality, things exist by dependent origination, whereas my mind is solidifying everything. That is what traps me in the dream of samsara. To be free from the dream of samsara, I have to, to, I have to see that nothing really exists independently outside my mental projection. Okay. <clears throat> the second last paragraph, page 65. What is the causal relation in? Oh, you really read this already. Huh? You were a couple of lines from the end. Yes, we'll read it again anyway, it doesn't matter. Have we read it? Most of it. Okay, let's see, let's read uh, line 4, paragraph, second last paragraph, line 4. If there is no seed, pistol, if there is no seed, the sprout cannot be, cannot arise, and so on, until finally without the flower, the fruit cannot arise. Which means we get understanding of the dependent arising. Right? For example, the way uh, the, the Sanjayji and, and the Chet, two of them, uh, two of them stood up, right? Stood up knowing the dependent origination. Stood up to close the windows. Now, open or closed? Open. Open already. <laughs> knowing that, but the, by creating the factor of opening the window, then the fresh air coming into being will originate. So therefore they opened it, right? This is what we know, dependent origination. So the more we think like this, the more the dissolidification happens. The more the dissolidification happens, the more you will wake up from the slip of ignorance. This is the point. Okay. The last paragraph. Okay, no, the second last line, or the second paragraph. Second last paragraph, second last line. If there is seed, the sprout will form and so on, until finally, if there is flower, then the fruit will fall. In that process, the seed does not think, okay, now this is the point, that there is no age, it's just a purely dependent origination, purely dependent origination, that things are operating. Okay, in that process, the seed does not think, I form the sprout, right? The seed does not think, with the seed, you put the seed there, and the sprout comes into being. 
Sir, you still do not think that, okay, Sprout, I have given rise to you. And the Sprout will say, yes, yes, you are right, you gave rise to me. No, this is not what is happening. It's pure dependent origination. But it depends on seed, other, other factors enter. The Sprout origin is finished, that's it. It's purely dependent origination. Purely dependent origination. I, in that process, the seed does not think. I have formed the Sprout. No, does the Sprout think. I am formed by the seed. Likewise, the flower does not think. I form the fruit. Not as the fruit thing, I am formed by the flower. Yet, if there is seed, the sprout will take form and arise, and so on, until finally, likewise, if there is a flower, the fruit will take form and arise. Thus is a causal relation in outer dependent arising to be seen. Causal in the form. Now the condition, condition relation. 66, page 66. So how is the condition relation in outer dependent arising to be seen? As due to the coming together of the six elements, six elements, as to the coming together of which six elements, namely condition, conditional or condition, dependent arising condition, is to, see, is to be seen as due to the coming together of the elements of earth, water, fire, air, space, and season, season or time. In Tibetan, it is two, two has both connotations, time and season. And it's fine, you can just keep season slash time. Season has a very specific connotation here, and the time, time has a very broad range of connotations. Beautiful. Earth element functions as the support. Now look, how the six elements, they, um, they, they, serve, as a, they serve as a condition for the, 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 for the flower and the fruit to come into being. Earth element function as the support for the seed. Of course, the seed needs the support. Support the seed to plant the seed in the earth. The water element moistens the seed. It softens the seed by moistening it. The fire element ripens the seed. The ripening. Okay. The air element opens the seed. Air element opens the seed, meaning that the um, Okay, the air, air is the connotation of the, the one which moves, which allows it to move. Movement happens in the space, but what moves is the air. So that air moves the things and then it opens the seed to come out. The space element performs the function of not obstructing the seed. And season, or the time, transforms the seed. Time transforms the seed. And the, the, the season is fine. Because, for example, say the some of the flowers. Look at this interesting. Another very interesting thing. The flowers usually grow in which time? Which time of year? Spring. Which season? Spring. Spring. Uh, spring, summer. spring and summer. Okay. Recently, I was in Israel, and. Who dictated that the flowers should grow in spring and summer, not in autumn and winter? Who dictated that? Sacred karma. Huh? A karma? <laughs> okay. So, so what happened was that there's one person who, who plants flowers. Who plants flowers and whose business is flowers. Flower business. What he, did, what he does is that he deceives the youth season. He deceives the season. How? Simulating the conditions. Exactly. Simulating the conditions. And not only, the, not only that it grows in that, not only that, prior to that, the winter, the cold is required. Cold is required. It's not that in cold it doesn't grow. No, that cold is a condition required for the, for the flower to grow, for the flower to blossom in the spring. If this the cold was not there, cold was not there, and in the spring it does not flower. So he discovered that. So what he did was that he, in Israel, the cold was very unlikely. Cold, it should be like, I think it should be, that for a particular flower, the cold would be like 7 degrees centigrade. 7 degrees for about like 2 months. 7 degrees centigrade. Israel does not have that. The weather does not raise. Very hot, desert, hot desert. And then in the winter, 
maybe like 10, 11 degrees centigrade for a few days. So impossible for this flower to grow. So what he did is that he put all these flowers, these buds or the, the, the roots, in the refrigerator for two months. With like 70 degrees centigrade refrigerator, two months put their big refrigerators. And then take out. And then put them the, the give them the, the heat, the spring temperature, and the flower blossoms. And then they also need uh, the say the some of the flowers they need a lot of the what uh, the, the sunlight, the a lot of light. The flowers which which grow in uh, say the um, the, the Arctic Circle, around the circle, so in the summer, a lot of light. So some of them requires like 18 hours light per day. So what he does is that he puts light bulb there and put in the bulb for 18 hours. And then it comes up flowers. So when people cannot bring the flowers, they have to wait for the season, he brings the flower there. <laughs> Everything is, the nation is deceived. Uh, the nation, if that is created by God, what is deceived? He failed the, you know. This is amazing. This is how the dependent origin is operating. So next question is, next question is, how come that all these conditions, like the winter is required for that matter, like two months of cold is required? Who dictated it? This is another question that we have to seriously think about. So at one, when I was in the monastery, then two thoughts came to me. Either it is God or it is karma. Either it is God or it is karma. It cannot be random. It's so beautifully designed. So this for this is Stephen Hawking. He said the grand design. It's beautiful. It's amazing design. Either it's God or the karma. Besides these two, nothing. Okay, it's beautiful. Okay, so I'll stop here. Maybe one or two questions. One or two questions, if you have. Dirsha said that there are so many questions coming. Oh, who said it? Oh, the Sanjay said it. And Dirsha says so many things are coming the outside the what we discussed in the class. Okay, any questions from the group discussions?
So this conventionally, this is what we, we, what we are looking for. We are looking for the fearlessness. We are looking for the stillness of the mind. We uh, say the, the practice of the mindfulness to still the mind. So this is all what we are doing. So this, what is, all this is happening where? In the conventional sense. Conventional says, sense. My nature never stills. No, this is what I am saying. This is happening on the conventional level. Now the, the next thing is, in the ultimate domain, emptiness, dependent origination, to be seen as two sides of the same coin. In the domain of the ultimate, in the ultimate domain, never stilled. So what we see as stillness is happening on the conventional level, but the ultimate domain is never stilled. See, and I look at it as the example of the apple. Mm. An apple in and of itself is conventional. Yes, it yes. It is a positive phenomenon. Yes. It causes and conditions and it's always changing. The emptiness of that apple is not changing. That's true. And, and so when we talk about stillness... Okay, check out, I'll ask you one thing. And to say, it's not changing? Not, not at the... As, as the apple itself changes and deteriorates and moves, the emptiness of the apple, the apple is still empty. And then whatever the case, my question to you, emptiness of the apple changes or not change? Okay, so you said that apple changes, emptiness of the apple doesn't change. Right. My question to you is, apple changes, likewise, emptiness of the apple change or not change? The emptiness of the apple is, is not affected. Okay, it doesn't change. Correct. If it doesn't change, that's saying you eat of the apple. Then it changes. Finish. So it, the emptiness has changed there. But it doesn't change until it's gone, which is what I said. Which the no, example I say, say the apple, you eat the first, you take the first bite. That was the, that listen, was listen, the, listen, 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 listen. You take the first bite. Right. Apple changes. Yes. Still the apple is there. And the, the apple of the apple with the bite has come to being. Emptiness of the apple without the bite disappeared. No, 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 no. So I'm, I agree with you. What you said is correct. I am going for a fine tuning. I'm going for a fine tuning. What is that? Emptiness of the apple doesn't change. 100% correct. I agree with you. But why, why I'm throwing these questions is to see to what depth you have been there. The, when the apple is gone, the emptiness of the apple is gone. Likewise, when the apple, the bite, the first bite is the done, the first bite happens, apple changed. The from, the, from the fresh apple, it changed to the apple with the bite. Likewise, the emptiness of the fresh apple changed to the emptiness of the first bite, apple with the bite. I don't think there's any difference in the apple, whether it's a bitten apple or not, because take that now, There is, a, of course, one is fresh, one is not fresh. No, no, take, if you take the apple that's behind you, and you pick it up, by the time you pick it up from that table to put it in front of you, it has changed. Exactly. So if that's the case, then the emptiness of the apple is constantly changing as well, whether I've been at it or not. Is it change or not? It does not change. Okay, let's see. Emptiness of the apple on the table, emptiness of the apple in my hand, these two are one or different. The emptiness of the apple is the same. No, no, no. My question is emptiness of the apple on the table and just the apple in my hand. These two are one different. One. One. Which means the base should be the same. If the base is the same, apple on the table and the apple in my hand should be the same. Then, if that's the same, then they should... Then the emptiness of the apple changes constantly. Yes. So my question is, emptiness of the apple does it change or not? The emptiness of the apple does not change as long as the apple is existing. No, so the question, even though the apple is which means you have to, you are, in a way you have to say that as long as the apple exists, the apple is not changing, this is what you have to say. If you can say this, you can say this to the emptiness also. If you cannot say this to the apple, you cannot say this to the, the emptiness the apple, unless until you understand something nuanced there. Well, would you tell me the nuance I don't understand? This is what I'm picking, I'm trying to see if you have it. 
Okay, anybody? The answer is apple is impermanent. M2 is apple is permanent. This is true. But my question still remains. Apple, when you, when you take a bite, you bite the apple, the apple has to, from the fresh apple, it becomes the bitten apple. The apple is changed. Likewise, emptiness also changed, should have changed. Ap emptiness of the fresh apple changed to the emptiness of the bitten apple. These two are not the same. So it is changed. But emptiness is always permanent, it's always unchanging. So this should be able, we should be able to defend it. Not for the sake of defending, we should be able to see the nuance of this. Yes, in the in philosophy, in philosophy, the impermanent is defined as changing moment to moment. Okay, impermanence in a very let us not say philosophy, in a refined understanding. Otherwise, philosophy people may think that okay. Philosophy, it doesn't matter whether philosophy. So in a refined, in a very refined understanding, impermanence has a connotation of momentariness. So what's that? So sudden emptiness of the apple does not go into momentary change. It doesn't go into momentary change. Why not? Coming and going. Yeah, it happens. It, it is considered as a permanent phenomenon. Oh. A permanent phenomenon can come into being and then uh, it can, uh, you know, no, no. First, let us not say emptiness of the apple is permanent. Let us not say this. Although it is, because I'm putting throwing you this question: How is emptiness of the apple permanent? This is my question. Because I'm saying this, you cannot presuppose that it is permanent, right? So the question is: While emptiness, emptiness always emptiness is permanent, but because I'm question putting this as a question, you cannot come to the presupposition that it is permanent. So I'm throwing the, the debate that if the apple is impermanent, likewise the empty apple as well should be impermanent. You say no. How is the apple impermanent? My question to you. First moment of the apple and second moment of the apple, these two are different. Then the first moment of the emptiness of the apple and the emptiness of the second moment of the apple, these two are different. While the apple is still there, while the flower is still there, emptiness of flower is still there. Flower and emptiness of flower, these two are, they coexist. It's negative. So the negative. Whatever is negative, it doesn't matter. The negative does not change. The point is, how do you account for the flower to change? If you account for this, how will you account for how the emptiness of flower changes? The flower changes based on people, or apple changes based upon constant causes and conditions. Likewise, I'll say the uh, the emptiness of flower also changes because of constant conditions. Sorry, doesn't change. Huh? Emptiness of flower for instance change. Say again. Uh, emptiness of the apple that you are referring to that never changed in relation to that point of emptiness. Now, when you are saying change, you are referring to two different emptiness. Now, likewise, the flower when you are saying flower change, which means you are referring to two different flowers. No, it really was the same flower. No, it's not the same flower. The first moment and the second flower, moment of flower, these two are different. It's the same continuity. And that was yeah, emptiness, same continuity. No, Why, how not? That uh, emptiness would not be changing. It's just the same so, yeah, This is not a continuity. Why not? It is, the absence of something is, is stagnant. No, the, uh, the flower is stagnant. No, it's not. How it's not? How not? How not? The, the, the flower is no, no, if you give me the answer, I'll give the same answer with emptiness. So before you put me the question, debater, I understand. Before, you, before you put me the question, you put the question to yourself, put the question to yourself, apply this to the emptiness. Everything is in the balance. What is applicable to the flower is equally applicable to the emptiness, unless until you are able to pinpoint to the very nuanced position which demarcates between the flower and the emptiness of the flower. Otherwise, no point. <laughs> you cannot defend the position. Because then it absence of the substance. Yes, okay. So now that the Siddhanta, I should explain this to the group in the group discussion. Okay, so you find the answer lies there. You getting it? Okay, we stop here.
Okay, one question. Okay, this is a very, very, very good question. Okay, one, I'll, I'll give you the very standard answers. Standard answers, standard with respect to the standard test, so that you will not be swayed, you don't worry. Okay, maybe it is his point of view. No, from the standard answer, cause, condition, these two are synonymous. Cause and condition, these two are synonymous. What is the cause should be condition, what is the condition should be cause. Don't forget it, number one. Number two, yet in this text, again, very standard, this is Sutra. Here, Arimadriya, paraphrasing what Buddha said, that dependent origination of the causal relation, dependent origination of the condition relation. Two. Again, there's cause and condition split as different, not as synonymous. So there, it is like, okay, this, the questions are there, the questions are still there. So there, one, one thing that we can keep in, that we can keep in mind is the cause in this context. In this context, the cause can be thought of in one way, in one way, thought of as the substantial cause. For example, uh, for this, for this monk, this monk came to being from the clay, the clay, and the clay was initially it was very hard to make a salt. We have to put water in it and soften it, and then you give the shape of this. After giving the shape, then the clay, the water should go away. If it doesn't go away, then you know the, the this the this, the proper you know, shape will not be there. It can easily be disfigured. So how to make the water disappear? Let it dry or you give heat to this. Give heat to this. And giving heat is not only for the water to go away, but also to make it really hard. Okay, heat. So we see that the clay, the clay did not disappear. The clay transformed into this mud. But the water used, it disappeared. Heat is not retained here. Heat disappeared. Heat is not there. And also the potter. The potter is also not in this. The water is not in this. Water also evaporated. The heat is also, you give the heat, and the heat has disappeared. And give the game, fine. So all those things, the, what really remained there is the clay. So the clay is the cause of this month and all others are the condition for this month. Right? This is how we in the loose sense we demand the, the, the cause and the condition in the loose sense. But generally speaking, cause and condition, these two are synonymous. Whatever is cause should be condition. What is the condition should be the cause. Okay. <clears throat> yes, yes. Okay, we yeah, have just you know, ask it. It's about dependent origination and uh, entrance. Yes. So Shantila felt that the third level of dependent origination is the same as entrance. I felt that they are one entity that you can it. And they're like impermanence and product. One is certain that one is uh, less, one is gross and one is certain. Uh, I mean, besides one being positive and negative, I mentioned one. But. Oh, no, one is certain, one is gross. Oh, okay, these two are. So, similarly, with the dependent origination and emptiness, uh, um, I felt they were not, they were very, very close. And these two are close, these two are not identical. identical. It's not identical. So oh, one is positive, one is negative. And on top of the one is ultimate truth and one is conventional truth. Right? Okay, this is a very serious question. And then they told them that you also brought one thing, one entity, you have an answer to this. If possible, you know, discuss this in the group, right? There are several people who know this concept, and particularly those who are new to this concept, you can learn from Dr. Anil Pesh is there, then we have Shandila here, then we have Acham, the... 
Ajana de Archana 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 there and then we have the we have Shweta there, we have the oh Venugrata is there, Tora Vinda there, the Stanza Band, okay there are a number of them there. And Shapiro also you study there so many, many times. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. And also the Raviji. Yes, so you have to discuss. So these things, and where things are not too clear, I'll be happy to discuss in the class. Okay, we'll stop here. Yeah.